Hello, my name is Paul Arnold, and I'm one of the chaplains here at Glacier Hill Senior Living. And today, my special guest host is my brother, Scott Arnold, the Reverend Dr. Scott Arnold, who now lives in Los Angeles and pastors First Baptist Church of Los Angeles. And I was hoping to see him by now. He's been out there a year, and you know what's happened. COVID has happened. And so we talk on the phone and sometimes see each other's face. But Scott, tell me, what is the temperature out in Los Angeles today? Uh, right now, it's about 74 degrees. Uh -huh. Well, we bo both grew up in Midland, Michigan, and we like all four seasons. And right. yet, I'm a little jealous when you told me last uh, spring how nice it was there. But you've lived in a bunch of different states. So why don't you tell our audience here where you've lived? Born and grown up in Michigan. I still consider myself a Michigander. Um, but after... Uh, graduating from Michigan State University in, with a degree in urban planning and also some background in art. Um, I, I went to Chicago where I studied urban ministry. God called me into ministry uh, oh, about, let's say, five years after I became a Christian in high school uh, at the Memorial Presbyterian Church where Paul and I uh, we're active and with our family. I think you said uh, that for our mom, right? Do yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> of course. Our parents were greatly involved in the church, and we came to understand the, the joy and support and encouragement of a, of a great church. Uh, so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, but in Chicago, uh, in studying urban ministry, I served uh, some inner city churches and uh, also met my wife, Marilyn, who's Filipino. We got married um, in 1983. And uh, at that time that we got married, we moved from Chicago to Boston. Uh, we were in Boston three years before going to Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I served a suburban church in Boston as a youth pastor and then a uh, inner city church in Providence for about 10 and a half years. Um, in, the in a neighborhood nestled in a very diverse community. Um, and uh, also did, I did some chaplaincy while I was in Providence. I was part of a, well, more or less volunteer rotation of chaplains, but we would go in about a day every two weeks. We were rotated and helped. Uh, and that was, uh, that was great. I, I appreciated that connection with chaplaincy then and it was something I continued wherever I went. Then we went from Providence to Battle Creek, Michigan, where I was pastor at First Baptist Church in Battle Creek. Also did volunteer chaplaincy there. Uh, and then um, at First Baptist in uh, Battle Creek downtown, it was a old historic uh, church with a sizable Burmese congregation that eventually uh, grew to where that church transitioned to their leadership as a Burmese um, Baptist church, interestingly enough. Um, and then uh, we went to, um, from there to Quint, uh, to Grand Blank, Michigan. I don't uh, forget uh, Grand Blank. I, yeah, <laughs> we were in Grand Blank, Michigan for about six and a half years. Uh, good uh, active ministry there, uh, good sized church. Uh, and then we went from there to Quincy, Michigan, little rural town uh, just east of Coldwater on uh, Route 12. And uh, that was a good place to be. We were there about seven years. And then uh, from there uh, back east, we went to outside of Boston to a little town called Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, right in the thick of historic New England, we were just yeah. a few few miles from the North Bridge where the shot that was heard around the world was fired and uh, the, where the British and troops and the colonists uh, began uh, the exchange that led to um, the Revolutionary War. Uh, so that was an interesting place to be right down the street from Henry David Thoreau's birthplace and uh, Walden Pond, which I did a painting of, you see yeah, there in the fall, that, yeah. did an oil painting. I love that place so much and took a few pictures. I said, yeah, I'll make an oil painting of Walden Pond. Uh, 
so anyway, uh, but each church has had uh, a lot of joys. They should say when I was in Bedford, I was a part-time pastor, also a part-time chaplain. And I did more um, professional uh, work as a chaplain in Bedford uh, at a place called Carlton Willard Village, which it really is a great uh, living community, not all that different from Glacier Hills. And Paul and I compared notes uh, while we were both doing chaplaincy at the same time there. You there and me here or there <laughs> outside of Boston. Uh, but I really enjoyed chaplaincy there. And when I realized that we may be making some sort of a move, I, uh, I, I said goodbye to the folks there, but I'll, I just love chaplaincy. It's just to be part of a community where, you know, it's not churchy, but it's, it's a community of people who are diverse and, and exchanging ideas and sharing faith, sharing life together, uh, sharing grief as well, you know, and going through different things. But real community happens in, in many uh, uh, senior living communities. So I, I, en I enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah, we would compare notes and... There's a lot of challenges, um, and around here we have people at different levels of their uh, life stage, and having, mm -hmm. uh, one time there was a doctor who came here, and after we compared notes, he said his parents were living at that facility where you were at, so uh, he said yes. it's very similar, and the yeah. life plan community, you have a lot of the residents who invest in the community with their time and talents and resources, and we've had such a rich um, ministry here, but COVID has really thrown it for a loop, not being able to gather, um, not being able to do special events. Uh, it's been really tough. And now that you're in Los Angeles, and despite the weather being great, how <laughs> has COVID affected your church there in Los Angeles? So we came here last January. Um, and I honestly figured that I would be, you know, that we would stay in Bedford long enough where I could retire there. Both of us would retire there. New England is a beautiful place to be. We had lots of friends. Church life was good. And then God opened up a window to have me look at this option here. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to my initial calling to urban ministry. Um, yes, we do have two sons who live in California. That was a draw. But mainly we prayed about it. And as we just said, okay, God, what do you want us to do? We had no idea what was coming down the road with COVID, yeah. but, but God knew because really um, we can see that our presence here is not only appreciated, but we're adapting uh, in the midst of COVID. Um, here with the weather nicer, we're able to do outdoor worship and we're able to make the adjustments to still have social distancing, wearing a masks, uh, but we're you know, obviously been using more uh, online resources, putting up worship, and I put up Bible studies. Right. Um, and uh, at the same time, now that we're doing outdoor worship, we've gone from a big uh, Gothic style cathedral believe it or not this baptist church back in the 20s built this humongous spanish kind of fusion hero gothic cathedral the sanctuary holds like 1600 people it's it's incredible but i mean the church had dwindled down over the years to about 40 to 50 faithful people mm. um and even then when i <laughs> after a few weeks of being here, I could see that there were really only about 35, 40 people who were regular. Um, and so it's like, okay, we've got ourselves a new work here. Um, and things began and then all of a sudden COVID hit. I mean, we were starting some new ministries and then it's like, okay, now what do we do? Yeah. Um, so combination of things between online resources, Zoom meetings, um, but also the outdoor worship itself has been really great. And with the weather here, I mean, it really just 
made perfect sense. We yeah. invested in a better outdoor sound system. Um, I have some gifts in being able to plan and lead outdoor worship. We did it in New England at our church. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, kind of putting everything together, bringing everybody together, how to do this. Uh, we, the first Sunday or two we did it, we had about, oh, maybe 15, 20 people. I mean, uh, people were scared yeah. with COVID. It's like, what yeah. do we do? And now we have about 50 people coming, 45 to 50 people, about 45, yeah. Anyway, we, we've, we've seen some people are just grateful to get together and the worship times, um, are, you know, I still preach with a mask on and, you know, people say, how do you do it? And I still sing with a mask on that, you know, it's like, find one that works for you. And it's like, uh, we have to learn how to adapt and, and do so in a loving way. Some people, honestly, is there churches here in California that just like, if they don't care what the authorities and what science are saying, mm. and they'll just like have gatherings without consideration of how COVID-19 is a very deadly virus. Right. And, it, and they just, it, it's, it's maddening to see some of the attitudes at times among different religious groups. But yeah, we've shared our concerns with the way uh, some national leaders have not embraced what science has to offer instead oh, yeah. of thought as restricting their liberties. And hmm. one of yeah. the reasons I think our family is a little more sensitive to this is that um, we had an older brother, Bruce Arnold, who died of cancer age 40, of kidney cancer. And not too long after that, unfortunately, you got a diagnosis of cancer that really rocked us. And, yeah. um, but God was so faithful to you, but you're still receiving some types of um, treatment. But tell yeah. Tell our, our people listening about yeah. when you were diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, uh, well, it's almost uh, 20 years. Um, it'll be, I was diagnosed in uh, the year 2000 mm -hmm. <laughs> in December. Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed in fourth stage non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They hadn't. Uh, they didn't have the technology at that point to know exactly what kind of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma I had. They suspected it might be one or another, but nonetheless, um, uh, it was, you know, it was very well developed. It was far along. I had four good sized tumors and it was, my spleen was uh, significantly enlarged. Uh, it was in my bone marrow fourth stage. And so I began treatments in January of uh, 2001, and um, I really didn't know, you know, what, and, and the doctor wasn't making any promises. He said, well, we have treatments. We're going to try immunotherapy and chemotherapy together, uh, but we'll see. He said, the thing is, you're probably going to have this the rest of your life, however things go. It's not something we can cure. So... Uh, after my first treatment, um, and it was tough. The first re week was rough. It was take for your body to adjust to these antibodies that they have a monoclonal antibody called rituxan. It takes your body a little bit of a fine adjustment, and and really it's it's not easy at first. But I got through the first week uh, by the grace of God and a lot of prayer. Um, the following week, one night I was praying and uh, I said, Lord, I, I don't know what's coming, but I'm going to put my trust in you. And I started praising him. My wife, Marilyn, had fallen asleep and I was just in my heart praising God. And then all of a sudden the room became very bright. And in the midst of that brightness and which I was, it was just so beautifully bright. I thought, what is going on here? Uh, I saw Jesus and he came to right to where I was and put his hands on my head and my shoulder. And I felt the most beautiful energy, the most beautiful presence, the most beautiful impartation of love into me and joy that was just perfect. And I'm like, 
I was so overwhelmed. I didn't know what to say. And I'm just like, and I just felt this beautiful peace. And then he left, but I felt like he, well, he's all, he's with me always. I always, I believed that and experienced God's grace and God's Holy Spirit before, but this was something more that was, I felt maybe healing. Uh, I told my wife at the point when I could speak about 30 minutes later, I woke her up. I said, let me tell you what happened. And she said, oh, that's nice, and rolled back to sleep. <laughs> next morning, we talked about it, and and uh, she said, oh, yeah. Well, the next day, it was a, like a Tuesday or so there, I, I had a CAT scan. Several days later, saw the doctor. He walked in the room. He said, what happened? It's all gone. What happened? And I told him. And being a Muslim, he said, uh, wow, you Christians are different. <laughs> I, I, I said, so what do we do now, doctor? He said, I don't know. <laughs> we, could just, we could keep up with the treatments or we could wait and see because from what I can see, it's gone. All your lymph nodes are to where they should be. No evidence of your spleen being enlarged. Uh, he said, I, I don't know what happened, but a miracle. And so, so I said, you know, we started this. I believe in finishing something I begin. So let's go ahead and finish the treatments. And I went through it and it was manageable. It was all right. And, uh, you know, until just uh, about a year and a half ago, it, it, you know, everything was going along well. I did have to, at one point, begin some immunotherapy in, in the sense of receiving antibodies. But my doctor had told me years ago, he said, maybe someday, you know, you might need to get antibodies. It doesn't necessarily mean your cancer will have returned. It's just that you had so much cancer in your bone marrow, your bone marrow may not have the capacity to produce all that you need because of the gap that it left, the cancer left. So, um, but the cancer did return, but we caught it early. I went through similar treatment. And right now, um, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, everything's going well. And I just take a daily pill. And all that does is it uh, called Ibrutinib. And I have, and they were able to focus on the diagnosis. And it's called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And you can say that five times fast if you want, but... I don't think I can. <laughs> uh, but, you know, things are going well, and uh, I, I still get uh, regular infusions of the antibodies. But, you know, God has extended um, my life, and I'm grateful, and it helps me uh, tune in and listen to what others are going through and not only be empathetic, but helps me have a greater sensitivity and hopefully say a few encouraging words, whether it be chaplaincy or pastoral care. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, I see it as a gift. Every challenge yeah. can be a gift. It, I think when a family goes through cancer multiple times, it does change you and expands, I think, your level of compa compassion and, and empathy for other people. And yeah. I remember when our brother Bruce got cancer, our dad told me he wished it was him. You know, he had lived his life. And mm -hmm. why have our brother die at 40? And he actually died on his birthday. When, and so there was some survivor guilt our dad had. But you are in a unique position because, unfortunately, your son Tom also had cancer and yeah. came to the U of M to Mott Hospital and they air flow, flow, brought a helicopter and brought mm -hmm. him in. Um, and I remember those were some tough days, um, wondering how it would turn out for Tom. I think he was 16 yeah. at that time. Yeah, he had just, it was just turning 16. Yeah. Um, and you were there to receive him at the hospital at U of M. And we were, we were so thankful that you were able to be right there as we were driving and he was airlifted in. Um, that was a tough time. That was, uh, well, three years after I had just survived the cancer. Yeah, and, but his words to us when he found out, and 
what he had. He said, well, dad, if you can survive it, I can too. <laughs> he was being wonderfully optimistic and stoic, uh, but we had some rough times. At one point, one of the diagnoses they gave us for, for Tom was that he, had a t he may have a type of cancer that was uh, something that would take his life within a month or two. So when Tom um, was in the hospital and with the diagnosis that was severe, they thought that radiation might be the best thing to do. Um, he was brought in for radiation. We had a lot of people praying. It was near the heart. The concern was that being near the heart, the radiation could have some effect upon him. Um, they marked him with a cross right in the spot, right in the center with a cross. And there he is brought into, right, brought right into the, um, into the room for the radiation. And all of a sudden, like a moment or two later, the phone rings and the guy, the technician picks it up and says, hello. He heard the message and he like slammed it down and ran over to the room and knocked, stop, stop, stop. And, and then the guy opened the door, what? We're just about to get started. They don't because he has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Don't, don't do it. And at that point we heard, because once we heard it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we realized he has a chance because it's more treatable. The T-cell lymphoma or the other thing that they mentioned would have been much different outcome. Right. So at that point, it would have, if they had radiated, it would have compromised the whole treatment and regimen. And so at that point, they pulled him out and, and a whole new course was set in motion. Right. Uh, and I'll tell you what, talk about answer to prayer at just the right moment. Pathology just happened to figure this out just as he was about to be radiated. Right. And we had all these people praying around the world and uh, God intervened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Tom went on to get better. It was a long mm -hmm. go in the hospital, a lot of treatments. Yeah, it was tough. Um, and in Dai, your, Marilyn, your wife would sleep on this little bench in the mm -hmm. room and I would go visit. And, right. But he recovered and then he went to University of Michigan. And he sure did. For a yeah. bachelor and then master's of social work. Uh, yeah. Michigan. I remember being at both those events and thinking yeah. how good is God that, you know, Tom was able to recover and being a patient of Mott, he's always going to be tracked by Mott as well to see how he does and Mm -hmm. and, tremendous. and then you have a wife who has spent a career as a nurse. And yes. She just retired from the Veterans Hospital out there in LA. That's right. She, uh, well, she grew up uh, in the Philippines as a Filipino, uh, was trained as a nurse, came to this country in 1978, in time for the blizzard of 78. <laughs> well, she wanted to go I home. She, she said to her sisters in Chicago, What's all this snow? At first it was fun, but oh, this I want to go home. <laughs> well, anyway, here in LA, she's much more at home with the weather. She's like, wow, this is nice. Um, but she just retired. Uh, she did a nursing in a lot of different areas, intensive care, uh, medical, surgical. Um, uh, she did all sorts of nursing and more recently case management for the Veterans uh, Administration both yeah. in Boston and here in LA. Um, yeah. So her being a nurse has been very helpful as far as my oh. pastoral care and chaplaincy. And, you know, there are things that she helps get me up to speed with as far as medical matters. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And uh, if our audience don't know, I've met most of the people who live here, but um, we still have a mother who's living and she remarried after our father died back in 2005 and we're blessed that they're doing pretty well and we're trying to be supportive uh, children and then we have children we're trying to support we're in that sandwich generation right now of our lives so you have a son in LA a son in uh, San Alto California uh, near San Jose Santa Clara it's uh yeah he works for Apple and he does some so some sort of project research that we can't know anything awesome. about. They're, you know, they're they're tight-lipped about their their <laughs> projects. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. He's he's been in, but he likes what he does. And our son here does videography mostly for 
different uh, car, uh, uh, let's say. Like car and driver. And he's, he's, he's done things for car and driver and also more recently a TV show called Proving Grounds. Yeah. 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 And then you have this Tom now who recovered yeah, Tom. from he lives yeah. in uh, Dallas, Texas. Or Florida. Yeah, Tom, Tom is doing social media uh, consulting with the firm that helps companies, let's say, uh, develop their online presence and, and, and figure out how to use social media and all that stuff so yeah he's the world so many people working from home my daughter is working from home uh, right her husband and my wife now is a teacher working from home so it's a strange thing mm -hmm. so yeah. as, we, as we wrap up scott what yeah. you know what do you tell your residents who are stressed out by covid and and even the recent election was a lot of anxiety for a lot of people you know, what words of comfort would you, did you give them and even give the people who are watching this show? I believe it's important to keep uh, the perspective of God and his love and his sovereignty. Um, we do see a lot of real concerns about social justice, our environment. What is the future? I remember uh, at Carlton Willer, one of them was a scientist who didn't believe in God. And uh, he was he was concerned for the future of the planet. And he said, I don't necessarily believe in God, but I really want to see this earth and, and humanity survive. Mm -hmm. um, but he had some life issues health wise that were where he knew he only had a short time to live. He started attending the Bible study I was leading and he wanted to talk about a lot of things. I listened and one of the things I heard was this concern about the future. And one thing I said to him, I said, um, I won't say his first name, but started with G. I said, G, God is not a throwaway God. God has a plan of love and redemption and we have to trust and have faith in God, even though this world has its problems right now, and ultimately believe that God has a redemptive work in mind, even though it's hard for us to see that. Um, and that gave him some comfort. And he went from being an atheist to being a person of faith. And I noticed this among some other residents, some people highly educated, doctors and scientists, we had an interesting community of people. And what they really wanted to talk about was uh, the future, their hopes, their concerns, their, uh, and sometimes they'd wanna talk about the past, but really they wanted some sense that their life uh, had made some difference toward what the future would be. Yeah. And, uh, and particularly family, concerns for family. Um, so the thing that I would say to them is, if we put our trust in, in God's grace and in, in God's providence and have faith, there's something that God is doing. And if we draw near to God, we'll find the comfort and peace and encouragement we need, and maybe even vision uh, that we can pass on to others. Well, yeah. we've been blessed to be part of a ministry. Scott was a big part of me hearing God's call into the ministry as well. And he gave me my first uh, Bible that I read a lot. And so thank you, Scott, for your ministry. Oh, thank you for yeah. all the encouragement you've given me. And we haven't even talked about all the times we played sports and went fishing. We both still love to fish. And right. we went fishing was near the Appalachian Trail all the yeah. way up. Well, actually, we went Michigan, Rifle River, the last time we yeah. went. And, yes, uh, yes, and yes. Cabo. But uh, maybe that's time for another chat. But I need to wrap this one up because Zoom is telling me my time is up. So thank uh, you, Scott. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we can talk again. <laughs> On the phone and other times. Uh, absolutely.